Welcome to Legal Tech Week for April 10th, 2020. I'm Bob Ambrogi. Later in the program, I'll have a conversation with Ron Friedman, author of the blog Strategic Legal Technology, about legal research company Fastcase gaining greater adoption in big law, and also about investment trends in legal tech in light of coronavirus. But first, the week's headlines. Rocked by the double blows of a major ransomware attack and the coronavirus crisis, global e-discovery company Epic is reported to have laid off some 200 employees. Also, in the face of the coronavirus crisis, two other major legal companies, Elevate and Rain in Court, cut salaries and costs. Elsewhere, the first in a planned series of global legal tech reports goes down under to Australia, where it found, at least pre-pandemic, a vibrant and kaleidoscopic industry. Here in the United States, legal research company Fastcase, traditionally seen as one primarily serving smaller firms, says it is taking a bigger share of the big law market. Following the shutdown of Atrium, the company that vowed to revolutionize legal services delivery, the law firm Crowell & Mooring said it has acquired a group of Atrium senior attorneys. In acquisition news, case management company Filevine has acquired Lead Docket, a lead tracking and intake management product. Finally, a new resource from Volters Kluwer comprehensively tracks COVID-19-related legal developments. And the best part, it's all free. So those are the headlines. Now let's go into more depth. For the second week running on this show, the top story is of layoffs at a major e-discovery company. Last week it was Disco. This week it's Epic. Sources tell me that Epic has let go some 200 employees and that more are possibly slated to be let go in the future. This comes just six weeks after the company suffered a major ransomware attack that took its systems offline for nearly a month. While the company has not responded to my requests to confirm or comment on the story, it's likely the coronavirus crisis only compounded the company's woes. Two other major legal tech companies also appeared to be feeling the financial consequences of the coronavirus crisis as both Elevate, a legal services and tech company, and Rain in Court, the startup striving to be the app store for law, have cut salaries and other costs, according to a story by reporter Sam Skolnick at Bloomberg Law. This week brought the release of the first of a planned series of global legal tech reports that will look at the state of the industry in regions around the world. This inaugural report focused on Australia, where the report found both good and bad news. The good news is that Australia has a vibrant and kaleidoscopic legal tech industry, the report said, but it remains one where women are severely underrepresented as founders or co-founders. The big question, of course, is the impact of the pandemic on these findings. Stevie Giassi, the report's director and also the CEO of legal tech company Legaler, told me he believes the long-term impact will be to drive greater adoption of tech by legal professionals And that will ultimately be a good thing for legal tech companies. On the legal research front, Fastcase founder Ed Walters has a conversation with Ron Friedman, author of the blog Strategic Legal Technology, in which he says that his company is gaining a greater foothold among larger firms, traditionally the domains of either Westlaw or Lexis. Why is this and what does it mean? In the second part of this show, I'll speak with Ron about their conversation. Last month saw the dramatic crash and burn of the $75 million startup Atrium, which had vowed to revolutionize legal services delivery. Now, law firm Crowell and Mooring says it has acquired a group of Atrium's senior attorneys, including the co-managing partners and a founding attorney. They will help bolster the firm's emerging companies and venture capital practices. In acquisition news, case management company Filevine has acquired Lead Docket a lead tracking and intake management product. Filevine, which primarily serves personal injury and mass torts lawyers, but has uh, corporate legal departments and and other types of, of legal operations as clients as well, says this furthers its goal of building a true end to end product, starting with intake and continuing through case management, document management, billing and timekeeping and accounting. Finally, as a number of companies extend offers of free resources to help lawyers through the coronavirus, 
Folters Kluwer released a comprehensive site for navigating COVID-19 legal developments. And the best part of it is the entire site is free and all underlying documents are free without even registration required. Links to that and to all the stories referenced in this podcast are on the podcast page in the show notes, so check that out. That's the news roundup. Now let me bring in Ron Friedman, author of Strategic Legal Technology blog, to discuss some of the stories he covered this week. Joining me now is Ron Friedman. Ron is a lawyer, legal business consultant, who's probably best known for his blog, Strategic Legal Technology, where he writes about legal tech and law practice management. Ron, how are you doing today? Good, Bob. Thank you for having me, and thank you for doing this public service for everyone during the COVID crisis. Yeah, thanks a lot, and I hope you're staying safe and well and, uh, and insane is on top of it all. Yeah. To everyone. So uh, you've written a, about a couple of things uh, over the last couple of weeks that, that struck me as, as interesting. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, one of them earlier in the show, which is your article about Fastcase gaining a larger share of, of the big law market. And I think that's interesting because many people, I would think, think of Fastcase as a service primarily used by smaller firms or think of it as that service they get through their bar association. And they probably think about, you know, uh, bigger firms using more likely to be using Westlaw or Lexus. So, so what's going on here? Great question, and that's why I wanted to talk to Ed Walters, the uh, co-founder and CEO. What's happened in the last few years is that many large law firms have tried or succeeded in going to single source as between Lexus and Westlaw, which are the two historic. Um, choices. And the firms that have gone sole source are interested in fast case as a second choice so that their lawyers, A, have choice, and B, it gives them at, at a way lower cost than either Lexus or Westlaw a negotiating point at the time of renewal. That That's important because there's always a fear if a firm goes sole source that come renewal time, they will have little bargaining power. So it's uh, one way to think about it is beyond a choice. It's buying an option for lower cost renewal of your primary service at the end of the contract. And are there, is the move to go sole, sole source, single source, primarily an economic one? Yes, that is because over time, when I first started in the legal market, Law firms are able to bill a significant portion of the online charges of Lexus, West, and other services that they used. And over time, clients pushed back on that. So as law firms started to have to absorb the, uh, a significant portion of the contract cost of both services, they had an economic incentive to drop one where it would not affect the practice of law. So are you suggesting that Fastcase um, essentially becomes a, a bargaining chip? here in negotiating price. Well, well, it's a bargaining chip, but it's also, I can imagine having having seen Fastcase and having seen the other services, I can imagine that some lawyers for some of their work might prefer the Fastcase interface. There may, there may also be certain work where the firm might encourage the use of Fastcase so that the usage is going there where it, it's truly unlimited and the renewal is not going to be dependent uh, two, three, or four years out on how much has been used. So there may be economic incentives to move some usage to fast case. One of the things I thought was interesting in your interview with Ed uh, is that he talked about the idea that he he doesn't think he he doesn't want to emphasize him, his company as perhaps a lower priced option, but as a more innovative one. Absolutely, and I was fascinated to learn from Ed that they are replicating features that, as he said, would take 10,000 humans uh, at, to write head notes or citation analysis at the legacy providers, and they're doing it all with software. So I think that's innovative. I also think they pioneered some easier to use interfaces uh, as well. Uh, what do you, I mean? Uh, what do you think about Fastcase as an option for bigger firms? It, it has evolved 
quite a bit over the, over the years. And I know I, I've, I've had conversations with Ed myself in which he's talked about this idea of trying to, you know, really build out uh, a, a broad base of offerings within within fast case, not just primary law, but but a, a secondary law and, and other kinds of materials. How is fast case doing at becoming, a, you know, a, a full service standalone legal research service? Well, I think well, and it depends on your metric, but Ed and I did discuss that. And uh, as I said in the interview with him, they have added prime, uh, secondary law treatises. So they are publishing some of their own. They have agreements with other providers. So I think I'm going from memory now. I believe they're, they have several hundred. I think it's from Walters Kluwer. So over time, they're trying to add the interpretive content as well as the primary case and statutory and regulatory content. Yeah. There are a bunch of legal tech, uh, rather legal research startups out there. Uh, do they play a role here in the larger firm market, do you think? And I'm thinking of a company like like Case Tax, like, like Ross Intelligence, uh, some others out there. Are they penetrating the large firm market at all? I believe so. Based on the funding they're getting and the stories I've read and talking to friends who are either lawyers or librarians in law firms, so I don't have actual data, it's anecdotal, but it seems like they're penetrating. And what I would say is there's a, they offer different analytics, a different way at getting at solving some of the problems. I was impressed when when choose some of the earlier startups, Judicata, Ravel Law, Lex Machina, when they, or Case Text, when they all came to market, they were solving problems that the legacy providers had not and or providing way easier and more informative interfaces. Let me switch gears to another article you wrote uh, recently. Uh, you had an interview with Scott Mozarski. Uh, Scott is somebody uh, some of our listeners may know as the former president of Bloomberg Law. He's now managing director of an investment bank. And you had a conversation with him about the state of investment in, in legal tech. And, and it was kind of, a, I guess, a two-sided conversation in that uh, you talked to both uh, the state of legal tech investment prior to the crisis that we now find ourselves in and post the crisis that we now find ourselves in. Uh, so what, what were kind of the, the, your, your takeaways? What were kind of the highlights of that conversation you had with Scott? Well, Scott, who's an investment banker for legal tech companies, is, is, remains optimistic. So we had started this interview before the crisis. It was almost done. And then what I realized is we'd have to address the crisis for me to publish it. So he's kind enough to do a round two. And he, there's a couple of sobering notes, uh, but overall, he's pretty optimistic that after the immediate crisis passes, legal tech will be in good shape. There will still be investment in deals in legal tech companies. Yeah, I mean, I, it seems like a lot of people seem to think that this um, crisis if anything, will spur greater use of, of legal technology among legal professionals, and that in the long term, that could be a good thing for, uh, for uh, legal tech companies. Was that kind of his view on it? That's part of it. I think there's the deal imperative itself, but there's also uh, that firms continue to evolve. And I think picking up, Bob, on what you said, We've broken a certain barrier with everyone working at home. So I've heard a couple stories of lawyers who said, I'm never going to work from home. I'll never give up my paper. They're doing both now. And so that may open the door to adopt more technology because as the people who are lobbying to be set up for, to work from home or, or tr have that option at least before the crisis or who are lobbying lawyers to give up paper, maybe they have more credibility now and there's a lot more software lawyers could use if they can make the time and fit it into their practice. I, we've, we've talked about a, a, a couple of the uh, the experts you've interviewed this week, uh, Ed Walters and Scott Mozarski, but you're you're an expert in your own right. You've been in this industry for a long time. What do you what do you think are going to be the long term impacts uh, or even the short term impacts of this crisis on the legal profession? Uh, great question. So I, I, I think that None of us know for sure. There's a lot of firms that have already, I think 40 or 45 have announced some cash conservation and that includes holding partner drawers or furloughs or some layoffs. And I think some firms will hurt. And what will happen is there will be an even higher premium post-crisis 
on firms differentiating themselves and offering value to clients. So I think that means the firms that are investing now, not just in legal tech, but delegating work to the lowest cost resource, resource person who can do it, using tech for efficiency, doing budgets, many of the same things we had in the past, there was less pressure. I think the value point, the price point has to be at a more favorable point from clients because many will be hurting for cash. So the so firms should be doing what they always should have been doing, but the pressure to do it is greater now. Yes. And I think- it comes down to. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I believe there will be for at least a couple of years, a decline in overall business that will affect yeah. firms differentially. But what that means is we will, I think, have excess capacity in the number of lawyers. And so that's scary, but I think realistic. Well, Ron, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, and I appreciate your taking time uh, to be my guest this week. Well, thank you, Bob. It's always great chatting with you. All right. Stay safe. You too. Bye-bye. That's it for today. The show is produced and edited by Ben Ambrogi of Populous Radio. This is Bob Ambrogi. See you next week.